Hey everybody, it's Brian House here for Housework and today we are going to be heat treating some A2 tool steel. Uh, this is a series of videos that I'm putting together about working with A2 and so uh, this is video two of that series. Um, essentially all we're going to be doing today is heat treating this. I've never done it before and uh, in the last video that I put out uh, I talked a little bit about my confusion around the process of using A2 and then heat treating it. And uh, this morning when I woke up, I was actually planning on shooting this video today, and I woke up with the email in my inbox from a guy, his name is Mike, and uh, he says, I have been in commercial and aerospace heat treating for nearly 30 years. I have helped in the design and development of heat treat processes for Gerber, Leatherman, Buck Knives, SOG, along with some other small shops. He does confirm that the reason why I have some warping in my blades is because of the machining process and that I should have actually uh, machined equally on both sides, flipping over and back and forth. Um, and yeah, I probably should have done that. It would have probably taken significantly less stress doing that. So um, I was lazy and just did one side. Um, he gave me a blueprint on how to do this, which is pretty amazing. So the typical hardening process for A2 is as follows. Hang knives vertically, which uh, if you've ever seen me heat treat anything in this shop before, you'll know that uh, the repurposed ceramic kiln that I made, uh, actually you can, this is really the only way you can use it is you vertically hang everything. So that actually works out for me. Also need to hang them while cooling as well. Preheat the oven at 1350 to 1400 Fahrenheit for 30 minutes minimum and increasing to one hour based on thickness. Austin ties at 1725 Fahrenheit to 1775 Fahrenheit for a minimum of 20 minutes, increasing to one hour based on thickness and annealed condition. Now here's where it gets interesting. The air, the air quench. This, this, a2, this steel does not require you to quench it in oil. Now, some people do do that, and uh, I've seen that done, but in this case, we are not going to do that. We are going to do an air quench. And he says, air quench, pull from the heat source and allow to cool in air. Fan cooling will increase hardness response. If the blades are distorted after quenching, clamp between two plates clamped with large metal clamps before tempering and while warm to the touch. Double temper is always recommended for tool steel. Final temperature tempers to harden desires, and he gives us the tempering schedule for that, uh, and we'll go over that during the tempering cycle. Uh, Mike, thanks so much for reaching out and taking the time to put that together for me. That is really an awesome thing. Thank you so much. Uh, we are going to follow that, actually, today, because um, I've read really similar things on numerous different websites, but they... They're all just slightly different. You know, you get out there and you kind of read about it, but the overall process seems to be that, uh, what Mike had said in that email. Now I'm heat treating four blades today. As you know, I hate waste uh, and I want to be as efficient as possible, which is the reason why I waited uh, to not heat treat some of these blades right away. I wanted to have at least four or five uh, to do all at once. So these are varying thicknesses. Let's just take a quick look here. Okay, so this is, 0 0.125, 0 0.101, this is my thickest one, 0.1185, and my thinnest one, which is the first one I made, and that's 0 0.087. So these will all heat up relatively around the same time, I would imagine, because the thickness is pretty, pretty close. So... I guess the, really the next step is to hang them and get them into that oven and bring them up to temperature. I'm going to let them sit at 1350 to 1400 degrees for about 20, 30 minutes, and then push it up to 1750 for another 30 minutes and let it air cool. All right, let's get started. Now I made this uh, little fire brick with a bunch of holes in it and I used stainless TIG wire to actually create some, some hooks so we can hang a bunch of knives at once. And that seems to be working out pretty well. The one thing you gotta really watch for is that these do get soft over time. So, you know, you may wanna replace them, but they're super cheap. If you go to your welding supply place, you know, you can buy a whole bundle of these for a few bucks, so. So here's my little setup for hanging and 
uh, cooling knives after I'm um, done heat treating them or if I'm in the process of annealing I like to use this thing. I've got just a piece of wire shelf here just repurpose that and this is my table saw and I just basically clamped this down so it can't move and uh, put the fire bricks up on top of here and then thread my blades down onto the TIG wire. Now something to take into consideration when you're doing this is the next time you touch these they're going to be very very hot and you want as little room for air as possible. So if these TIG wires get tangled up on the way out of the kiln and get caught then uh, that's a problem. So you really want to keep these bent towards the top and not out at an instance where I was trying to pull some blades out and they, uh, the, the, the wire kept getting hung up on the bottom of the lid. And, uh, you know, that doesn't sound like a huge problem until everything is 1,700 degrees. And then what do you do? So, and you got your hands full and you're hanging and you're doing all kinds of stuff. So if you're doing it by yourself, you know, safety's key and just, you know, go slow. Don't rush. All right, let's get that oven on. So here's my old ceramic kiln I picked up for about 300 bucks on Facebook Marketplace. And then I built this. I made a video about this. You can go back and take a look or I'll put a card up so you can check it out. This is a, um, a high temperature version of these little PID controlled ovens that you see people out there that they have. They make them for home brewing and so on. Uh, it's exactly the same setup. It's just a lot more amperage. So we went ahead and uh, put all that together. And uh, if you're interested in building one of these and creating your own heat treating stuff, I have links down in the description that will take you to all of the parts that I use to make this happen. So I'm gonna switch it on and it comes back on. I already set it to 1400 degrees and let's let it uh, do its thing. I'm gonna go ahead and grab the knives and ramp these up. I can already see that maybe this cleaver should be more towards the middle. I'm going to take him out. It's always best to do this now while everything's cool. Now this kiln takes about, to get to 1400 degrees is going to take a little bit over an hour. Okay, now you can see we're getting close to temperature here. What our PID controller says is 1273. And what I like to do is just double check those temperatures with an independent unit. This is an Omega HH806AU with a Type K thermocouple just uh, shoved in one of the sides there just to double check the temperature. This says that we are at 1262 which is about a 10 degree variance and I'm comfortable with that. Uh, the thermocouple from that unit is actually down in the middle. And this thermocouple is up near the top where the knives are. So I'm comfortable with that range. I think that's probably fine. So uh, anyhow, we're just getting close to that soak point. So we're gonna let it sit at 1400 degrees for about 20 minutes and then ramp it up to 1750. See here, it says 1297. Go ahead and power this on. So we're at about a 20 degree difference now. So that's uh, getting a little bit of a wider gap. Okay, so we've reached 1353, 1354. Uh, the PID controller does say 1382, so there's now a 40 degree variance between those thermocouples. This PID controller, I can actually modify it to adjust at certain temperatures. Uh, there's also an auto-tune functionality, so I've never really ramped it up quite to this temperature with this PID. This is actually a new PID, so I'll probably go ahead and um, adjust those temperatures as such because if there's a, let's see, it says 1384 and on this it says 1356. So if there's that much of a variance between the two, uh, I'd like to just split the difference so that it actually controls it. And you can see the 
heating coils are coming on and off and that's because the PID controller is sensing that it's getting close to that temperature and it's ramping up. There's a little microprocessor in that PID that is sensing that, that temperature from the thermocouple. However, at 1354, we're just at the mark. Again, I'm comfortable with that because I know we're sitting at 1354 at least, but I'd really like that PID controller to uh, be a little bit more accurate so I don't have to think about it. Again, these are all just little tweaks that I think we can work out in the process. Hey Siri, set a timer for 30 minutes. Okay, 30 minutes and counting. Let's talk a little bit about tempering. I temper in a very simple sort of cheap Black & Decker Walmart uh, oven that's actually controlled by this little device here. I actually used Jay Keaton's design for this. He put out a really great video. I will put a link down in the description or put a card up here so you can actually watch that. He came up with a pretty simple, easy design for this. So you can use a pig controller to control the temperature inside of a tempering oven or like a little cheap oven like this. Now, I went ahead and bought the Auber a uh, little more upper end one so I could actually program my tempering cycles in there. So when Mike sent me that email, he said, you know, you want to take it 300 degrees for two hours and then maybe a 400 or 450 degree for another two hours to get your optimal strength out of the knife. Well, instead of having to program this to 300, let it soak, time it, come back to it and so on, um, I can actually create those steps right into this Auber controller. So if you've ever wanted to learn how to do that, I'll probably make a video on it. It's quite simple. The interface is a little janky. It's, you know, you got these little tiny buttons and you got to set these time stamps and then it kind of goes from there. But what I did was, as I set my thermocouple inside of there and I threaded it inside of a piece of 1095, that's about 0.187 or so. That way, whatever I put in there, that's going to simulate the temperature of that particular piece that I'm working on. So instead of it measuring the ambient air temperature inside of the oven, it's maintaining the temperature of that piece of steel. And to me, that makes more sense because that's actually what I want it to do anyway. I want it to keep those pieces of steel that are in there at a specific temperature. And then I want it to shut off, cool down, and give it some time to do that. And then I want it to ramp back up to another temperature and temper again for maybe say another two hours and then shut completely off. That means I can walk away from this thing, do other stuff, I don't have to think about it and it'll just kind of do that for me. And what's really kind of cool about this is these things are notorious for not really maintaining good temperatures. In fact, I checked it uh, when I was doing the uh, auto tuning on this and uh, it was like 100 degrees off in some cases. So if you're using a little tiny cheap oven like this, for tempering, you may want to consider checking that with like say a thermocouple or some sort of device that will actually show you what temperatures you're actually achieving and is it maintaining that temperature because uh, I couldn't get this thing to maintain a temperature with the built-in thermostat that's inside of it. It would go up and down and up and down 50, 60 degree swings and like I said, it was off by about 100 degrees and I checked it with two different devices just to make sure that I'm you know making some sort of effort to not just utilize the thermocouple that I put inside of it. So I went ahead and pulled the instructions out and found where you can put an input variance on this PID controller. This is a setting right here, offset value plus or minus 100. And I was able to really dial in the PID controller now. It's actually reading at 1762, which I trust. Um, as you can see here, we are now within a one degree variance of what the PID is saying. And I, uh, I, I, what basically how you do that is you use another thermocouple that's is, that is identical and check it with a device like this. I was uh, blessed enough to have a father-in-law who is in this industry. So he, a, he sent this to me and, um, at first when I got it, I thought, well, I don't know what I'm gonna do with that, but it has proven to be very useful because I now have something to double check whether or not this cheap Chinese PID is actually doing 
what it's supposed to be doing. So now we're in a two to three degree variance, um, which to me is, is awesome. So yeah, the, the offset value, basically you just check it against another source and pull out the, um, the instruction manual. I went down to this, this offset value here, which is uh, pretty straightforward. I mean, a display value and you just put it in as a temperature and it was uh, very easy to do, just some simple math. So, hey Siri, set a timer for 30 minutes. Okay, 30 minutes and counting. Also, just to give you an idea of how hot these fire bricks are on the top of this kiln, right now they're measuring out at 770 degrees approximately. The lid of the kiln is 285 degrees, 82 degrees. And the outside of the kiln, about 300 degrees, 336. So yeah, that's, that's some hot stuff there. Okay, we've hit that mark of 30 minutes. And uh, this is something I like to double up my gloves on. These are Fire Guard Commander gloves, and because this is so hot, I double up with some work gloves underneath. All right, here we go. She's at 1800. Kick on this fan. hanging for about three minutes. We're already down to 480, 470. Okay, so there are about 230 degrees now. Bring them over here. This fire brick is still really hot. Take them off of this. So we are now going to let's take a quick look. Yeah, still got a little bit of a warp. Not too bad. This one definitely has a warp. Actually, it's not too bad. This one has a little bit of a warp as well. So I'm going to go ahead and put this into the temper clamped all together. It's a little fun trick that uh, I learned from Dave Evader from Evader Knives. Guy is. Uh, been making knives for a long time. He's full of really good info. If you haven't checked out his channel, you should. I'll put a link down in the description. Interesting character, for sure. Quite a bit of carb fell off of these, but actually it was a lot less than I had thought it would be. Right into the temper she goes, the Auto Temper 3000. Two hours on the first cycle, cool down, and then two hours at 400 degrees. Okay, so it's day two. Uh, I let this go ahead and Auto Temper did its program run of tempering, which was two hours at 300 degrees, then a cool down to room temperature, and then another two hours at 400 degrees Fahrenheit. 
And uh, yeah, I think it went well. Check these out. All right, let's take a look. A moment of truth here, see if those warps came out. The one I was concerned about the most was the cleaver. Eh, still got a little bit of a curve to it, but nothing we can't live with. Straight as an arrow, yeah. So you can see here there's uh, quite a bit of junk on the outside of it, the, the decarburization has, uh, it's really quite beautiful though, you know, there's like this nice blue and sort of a rusty look, oxidation look to it, it's, it's, it's kind of a cool look. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and clean it up. This one I did some texturing on, so it'll be kind of interesting to see what that looks like once I take all this uh, scale off the outside. So let's take it over to the grinder and see what it looks like. These came out pretty nice actually, and um, it passes the skate test with a the file. They are very hard. I am not sure how hard these are actually. I uh, don't have a Rockwell hardness tester, but Dave over at Evader Knives does, and maybe I'll send him one and he can run a test for me. I'd be really super interested to know how hard these are. I did profile down the cleaver and put an edge on it, just really quickly put an edge on it. It's not perfect, but need some refinement. So it will hold an edge, which is nice. Like I said before, this is a series of videos and this is the video number two of probably four or five. And in the next video, I'm going to be refining down this blade and actually getting it ready for a handle. That will be the next step of this process. So yeah, I'm really interested to find out what the corrosion looks like on these. So maybe we'll run some sort of test where we get it wet and figure out, you know, what does it look like if we do some sort of coating on it, maybe uh, beeswax and mineral oil or something along those lines just to protect it. If you got something out of today's video, Please leave me a like, and if you'd like to see what happens next in this series, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. There are links down in the description that uh, connect you with all the tools and things that I use in my studio and workshop here. Those are affiliate links, and uh, I do get paid a small commission if you do buy anything from there. Uh, however, it doesn't cost you anything, so it's a, a free way to support my channel. Now, if you are interested in financially contributing to my channel, I do have a Patreon page now. So uh, in order to create this kind of content and do these kinds of projects, they are expensive. So any financial support would be greatly appreciated. Uh, as always, guys, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. And if you leave me a comment, I always read and respond to all of them. So have a great day. My name is Brian House, and this is Housework.